experimentation, an effective way to learn about the world around us and everything in it. But the thirst for knowledge can become a sinister game when the ends justify the means. Wendell Johnson was a psychologist at the University of Iowa who dedicated most of his life to trying to discover the cause and cure for stuttering. Though he had made many great contributions to his field, there was one black mark that would haunt his name forever. Johnson conducted a study that would try to discover the relationship between a person's thoughts and feelings in relation to their stuttering, and if it could be a learned behavior. Though the study would reveal a great amount of information regarding this relationship, some argued that he went too far to obtain it. Johnson selected one of his graduate students named Mary Tudor to conduct the experiment. With a competent student to gather research, all he needed now were test subjects, and a nearby orphanage would suffice for that. So Mary gathered her supplies and ventured to the orphanage on January 17, 1939. That day, the experiment that would come to be known as the Monster Study began. Mary had gathered the students into two different groups, ones who were known stutterers and the others who were not stutterers and could speak quite well. The group with children that stuttered received positive attention and were told that their stuttering was just a phase and that they'd get through it and not to listen to anybody who might have criticized them. The group of well-spoken children received negative attention. They were lied to and told that they showed traits of a child that could become a stutterer. They were told that they must not stutter at any cost they must not stutter. The children, so afraid that they might stutter or even slip up on a word, began to mentally shut down. Their grades dropped off, they would develop nervous habits like snapping their fingers if they felt they might have trouble with a word, some even refused to speak at all, fearing that they would become a stutterer if they tried. The children disconnected from their best friends, hardly speaking to them anymore. One child even ran away. Mary Tudor had felt remorse for what she had done. She went back to the orphanage three times after the experiment had ended. She told the once well-spoken children that they weren't ever meant to stutter and that they could speak freely, but the damage had already been done. In a letter to Wendell Johnson, she wrote, I believe that in time they will recover, but we certainly made a definite impression on them. Unfortunately, she was only half right. Their impression was such a powerful one that some of the children lived with the damage from the study for the rest of their lives. The University of Iowa publicly apologized for the monster study in 2001, 62 years after it had all started. Harry Harlow was a psychologist who studied maternal bonding, or as he liked to call it, the nature of love. He would rear newborn monkeys with surrogate mothers, often made of metal and wrapped in towels. Some of the surrogates were designed to be abusive, scaring or hurting the newborn monkeys. Harlow wanted to determine whether the newborn monkeys were motivated by food or affection, and he came to discover that, yes, they were motivated by affection more than food. Harlow lost his wife in 1971 and was treated before returning to work, having taken the loss very hard. But when he came back, his peers noticed that Harlow was different. His demeanor had changed. He abandoned his research in maternal attachment and began diving into the studies of depression and isolation. This is when Harlow would take a sudden and sinister turn. He took 12 newborn monkeys and divided them into three groups of four. All of them were stuck in different isolation chambers. The first group for 30 days, the second group for six months, and the third group for a year. All of the monkeys had become seriously disturbed. The ones kept in isolation for a year barely moved once they were released. They would not play, they would not socialize, some wouldn't eat and starve to death, they were even unable to mate. But this would not deter Harlow. He developed what he called the rape rack, where he could tie the isolated female monkeys so that male monkeys could mate with them. After the females had given birth, Harlow discovered more about what the isolation had done to them. The mothers were unable to care for their offspring and would often violently abuse them. Harlow wrote, not even in our most devious dreams could we have designed a surrogate as evil as these real monkey mothers were. And he was right. One mother even pinned her baby down to the floor while she chewed off his hands and feet. Another crushed her baby's skull. But Harlow was not satisfied. He felt that the test didn't produce a true feeling of depression for the monkeys, 
so he developed something that he affectionately referred to as the Pit of Despair. Harlow wasn't using newborn monkeys anymore, no, he would wait until the monkeys were old enough and attached to their mothers. That's when he would rip them away and put them into a new type of isolation chamber. The chamber consisted of an inverted pyramid with slippery sides and a mesh top. The monkey would be placed in the point of the pyramid and would spend the first day or two trying to climb out, but would be unable to. Eventually, they'd give up and huddle into a corner and remain there. Even the happiest of monkeys were severely damaged upon being released. Harlow had projected his personal anguish onto his studies, and for this, has gone down in history as a monster. General Shiro Ishii was the chief medical officer of the Japanese army. He was a secretive man who seemed to be more entertained with hurting people than helping them. He was eventually put in command of an epidemic prevention department called Unit 731. Ishii oversaw a special project which involved human experimentation. In this way, he could test the horrific effects of chemical attacks on human beings and have a front row seat for the whole thing. But Ishii's curiosities went far beyond just that. He assembled test subjects comprised of prisoners such as bandits and political activists, but this wasn't a vast enough sample for him. So he saw no problem in taking in people who were rounded up by the military police for suspicious activities. These included elderly people, pregnant women, and even infants. Some of the prisoners would be infected with various diseases and promptly cut open so that the scientists could observe the effects of the disease on the organs. Men, women, children, and babies were subject to these vivisections, where they were not only kept alive during the procedure, but they were performed without any form of anesthesia. The test subjects were fully awake and aware while they were being cut open, and there was nothing they could do to stop it. To study blood loss, prisoners would have limbs amputated and sometimes reattached to the opposite sides of their bodies. Some prisoners would have certain organs removed before being sewn back up, such as their stomachs, lungs, liver, and parts of their brains. Other prisoners would be raped and infected with syphilis and gonorrhea to study the effects of the diseases. Some were tied to posts and used as target practice for weapons, such as chemical weapons, grenades, or even flamethrowers. Subjects would be deprived of food and water to determine how long it would take them to die. Some were placed in high-pressure chambers until they died. Others were stuck in centrifuges and spun until death. And some others were simply buried alive. After World War II had ended, Douglas MacArthur granted immunity to Ishii and the physicians of Unit 731 in exchange for their research data. Ishii had walked free of his heinous crimes and died from throat cancer at the age of 67. According to his daughter, he converted to Catholicism shortly before his death. Some people are willing to do anything to produce a result, to learn what they want to know. Hopefully you never become the means to justify their ends. But I suppose you never know. Remember, you may not believe it, but anything is possible in a world so seriously strange. I'm Rob Dyke, and I'll see you next Wednesday. Please show the artists of this series some love by liking her fan page linked in the description below. And be sure to subscribe to my channel, because you won't want to miss what's next.